Welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast with me, Dan Haylett. This show will help you navigate the intricate financial and non-financial landscape of retirement planning, investment and income strategies, and the human experience beyond the traditional work-life paradigm. Join me as I delve into the challenges, triumphs, and unexpected journeys individuals face as they transition into this new phase of life. From experts across many different areas to personal stories, we uncover the secrets, insights, and practical tips to empower you on your retirement journey. Whether you're just starting to consider retirement or already enjoying this chapter, this podcast is your guide to making the most out of this remarkable phase of life. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. I'm your host, Dan Haylett. Today's conversation is with David Blanchett. David is Managing Director, Portfolio Manager, and Head of Retirement Research for PGIM DC Solutions. In his role, he developed solutions to help improve retirement outcomes for investors with a specific focus on defined contribution plans. Prior to joining PGIM, he was the head of retirement research for Morningstar, and before that, the director of consulting and investment research for the Retirement Plan Consulting Group at Unified Trust Company. In this episode, David and I discuss retirement planning and income generation. David emphasizes the importance of understanding the cost of retirement and the need to start planning early. Retirement is a complex and individualized process, and the traditional concept of retirement is evolving. David suggests using the term financial independence instead. David challenges the 4% rule for retirement withdrawals, suggesting that a personalized approach is necessary because flexibility in retirement income planning is crucial as it allows for adjustments in spending based on changing circumstances. He also talks about why holding cash can provide both economic and behavioral benefits in retirement portfolios. Other highlights of our conversation are where we discuss the need for advisors and coaches in retirement planning, the importance of understanding and addressing regret risk, the value of spending money on experiences and giving money and time away during your retirement. We also look at the impact of longevity risk on retirement confidence and the benefits of guaranteed lifetime income in retirement planning and David's famous retirement smile concept. So, without any further delay, let's get straight to my conversation with David Blanchett. David Blanchett, a very warm welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. Good to be here. Thanks for joining us, uh, David, all the way from Kentucky uh, in the States. Um, you are very, you'll be very familiar to the um, American listeners, but maybe not so much to the listeners over in the UK. So you do amazing work and have done amazing work with over 100 published papers, um, really looking at retirement and income planning and personal finance. Um, so one, I'm really grateful for the work you do. It helps us shape some of our thoughts about this really kind of modern new thing that is called retirement and, and how to generate uh, income for that. But I really just would love for you to spend a couple of minutes um, telling the listeners about you and how you've got to where you've got to today and how the hell you found the time to do 100 published articles on such uh, a deep and meaningful subject. Um, well, you know, thanks again for having me. Good to be here. Um, you know, if I go back like, I don't know, 20 plus years. I always wanted to be at like the financial planning and advising business. I don't know. I was like drawn to it in high school. For some reason, it like always fascinated me. And so I kind of started out as a financial advisor. Um, over time, I kind of worked my way into more of a research type role. Um, so for the, fa- for the past maybe 15 or so years, I've been doing research on a host of financial planning topics, um, retirement, uh, how to build efficient portfolios, just a whole host of things. So um, I would say I'm very passionate about uh, learning about retirement. Um, I'd like to mention both of my parents were uh, public school teachers, and so they taught me the value of an education. Um, and I just, I just love to research this really complex 
uh, problem. We were, we were joking about this before we got started. And like, this is really, really complex stuff. Like there's not going to ever be one answer because everyone is so different. And so it's fun to come at even kind of like the same challenge and the same questions, just using different perspectives as markets evolve. So, um, you know, I've done, I might need 200 now, I don't know. And I'm sure I'll do a few hundred more over the next few years. Yeah, some some really great stuff with some really great minds um, that that kind of concentrate on this area, right? And as we said before, this is, you know, this is retirement's pretty much brand new, right? A hundred odd years old. Um, our clients of today and the clients of the future are entering into a retirement that no one's ever really done before. So I think they're kind of first generation in how they're retiring. The retirement, particularly on the money side of things, is very different to their parents and their grandparents because now it's kind of all on them. There's a pot of money that have got that's got to last a lifetime. Um, and, and you you said in a recent article that that I come across and I thought was really fascinating um, that that retirement is the most expensive purchase most people w- will ever make. So um, I think that's a great way to kick off this conversation. I'm curious about what you mean by that, which which, uh, which I think is really fascinating. And what are the pitfalls of this really expensive purchase? Yeah. So, you know, I think that that particular quote stems from some research that I've done around, you know, how do we estimate the cost of retirement? You know, so if you're going to retire, you know, live for 30 years, I'll use the American term, spend $50,000 a year, you know, what is that going to be? uh, What does it mean to you in terms of savings? Right. And, you know, people spend money on different things. Right. So things that you spend money on are often called like a goal or a liability. Right. And you know, a home, a home could cost a half a million dollars. Okay. Well, retirement for most people will cost a million plus dollars a year. And so I think that really thinking through when you're going to retire, how much you're going to spend, all these things are really important just because it is, as you said, the most expensive purchase you're going to make. So understanding how you're going to fund that purchase is just critically important. It's important to start early, right? You want to start thinking about, you know, what you think you might want to do when you retire when you're 25 or 30 or 40, knowing that you're going to make adjustments along the way. But if you wake up, you know, at age 55 and say, hey, I want to retire in 10 years, it's probably not going to go well. I think it's a a really fascinating um, way of thinking about it and, and comparison. And something's just cropped in my head, right? I think if I... If I think about what else you'd spend a million pounds or a million dollars on, it, potentially a house, right? That potentially a property. I don't think you would spend a million dollars on a house from an auction that you never see the house on, right? You never, you never see the house. You might spend two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a uh, an investment property at auction, but you're never gonna not research something that costs a million dollars or a million pound. And I suppose that analogy is I do see people sleepwalking into retirement really and not understanding one how much it's going to cost and two the investment that they've got to make and and, and actually how the be- how how best to make um or, or you know what am I trying to say here how to best make that investment and how to do well from that investment um because i i think people often don't plan this very well it's a it's a really new thing as as we said and I, I do believe that we can really start to think about how we would best use that investment of money and therefore best use our time and how we're going to spend that that hard-earned savings. Right. I mean, no one knows – well, most people don't know how long we're going to live. Maybe maybe you know. I don't, I don't know. No, no, no. Um, well, no I don't think yeah. we'd be having this conversation, right? This would be a spreadsheet <laughs> and you'd know exactly what when it's going to be right. at zero. So. And so we also don't know like what the markets are going to do in terms of future returns, right? And so those are kind of like the two biggest drivers, things that we can't control ourselves that drive this outcome. And so you know, to your point about this house, like we don't know how big it is, how nice it is, where it is. And, and you know, to your point about sleepwalking, like people do get lucky. You could totally just kind of, you know, save some in your in your DC plan, you know, do some other stuff and you can be fine. But, you know, for those that, that, that do actively prepare – they're going to have more options. They're going to have the, a better possibility of a better outcome. So to me, I, you know, I fully acknowledge it's called estimation error. That's the fancy word we use in, in forecasts. Like we, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, but but having a good plan will help you address a lot of these uncertainties. So yes, we, we don't know what it's actually going to end up costing you. If I knew how long you were going to live, that would make things a lot more more interesting or more um, 
easier since we don't though you know having a really good plan that you can stick to and, and know what to do when things happen it can just it, it, it makes for better outcomes on average is kind of you know guessing or or not planning ahead yeah, yeah absolutely um and, and i think there's a bit more comfort in that isn't there? a bit more freedom that there's there's plans in place we might have um, we know that a plan is wrong the moment it's created, but we might have several versions of that plan that have different little scenarios in. So there's a bit of comfort there around the planning. And then also maybe the way that we're taking income with stuff like, you know, cash buffers and guardrails and these kind of things that give us some you know, human beings quite like a rule. You know, we like a bit of a bit of certainty. Um, so if we can create some of that around that um, around retirement, then because it's full of unknowns, if we can create some certainty, then it allows us to be a bit more free about uh, about how we're going to spend our money and time. You've written a lot about the being prepared for for retirement. You mentioned it um, uh, there. Do 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 you think people truly understand? And it goes back to the point I made a couple of times about this being first generation retirees, there isn't people to look up to, there isn't really models in this. This is a really, the research you're doing is really new because we've, you know, the data points are probably only 20, 25 years old in terms of how people are drawing off money. Um, So do you think people truly understand the complex nature of retirement? And are they, you know, are the plans that they're creating in general quite flawed and underprepared for all of these kind of unknowns and scenarios that we can build in and give people comfort over? You know, it's it's, it's obviously hard to generalize because everyone is so different about their preparations, about their goals. But I think that, you know, I, to be honest, I don't I don't love the word retirement. Um, you know, I think that, that financial independence is probably a better term to use to describe what most people seek because retirement, at least in America, maybe has some negative connotations. People oh, like hey, too. think about yeah. someone, yeah, like you're going to go golf or whatever it is for like 15 years and then die. Well, you know, retirement is, is, is radically changing for everyone. What it means to retire, what it means to keep working, how long you're going to live, what your activity level is going to be. Everyone has, has this different picture. And I think the key that planning gives you is it gives you more options, right? So if you want to be financially independent and give yourself choices about how you spend your time, the more you have saved for retirement, the more choices that you're fundamentally going to have. And so, you know, I don't know that that retirement is a word that that always motivates people to save because some people say, well, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to, I'm going to work forever. And I might say, well, that's cool. You know, you, you think that now, but, but do you think you might want to change your mind one of these days? Do you think that, you know, 20 years from now, you're going to have the same exact mindset about what you're going to be doing? And people might still say, well, yeah, I do. And others might be a bit more reflective and say, hey, you know, like, I like the idea of having optionality about this idea where I can make a change and pivot. And so I think that's kind of the goal is this notion of financial independence. And when you maybe use different terminology, I, I, what I hope it does is it kind of helps shift the mindset from this kind of overly set it, you know, just like people are going to sit down and, and not do anything and not work to like, hey, how do you want to spend, you know, your your second working life, whatever you want to call it, you know, when you're older and if you don't have any money saved, you're not going to have very many choices. And also, I believe that if we, the word retirement ha- has absolute neg- negative uh, connotations here as well. But I, but I believe it also has a a bit of a, a focal point, a misled focal point. It's I will be happy or I will be content when I retire, and and often people forget about the journey along the way. And retirement is not what they thought it was going to be because they haven't because they thought retirement was the thing, right? Oh, I, I just need to retire and then I'll be okay, won't I? And that's not you know how, how it works. And and it comes back to 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 a, kind of a bulk of the conversation I'll have with you. You spent a lot of your time thinking about, um, you know, basically funding retirement, right? How how are we going to pay for retirement, um, and pay for this phase of life? And let let uh, let's throw out the word retirement. How am I going to pay for a phase of life when I probably haven't got that much income coming in, and I'm drawing capital off a pot of money? Um, that's a long way, a long winded way of saying this is quite a psychologically hard thing to. To, for us human beings to start to do, um, and that's the, the the new nature of a modern retirement. Lots of people would have read about the four percent rule, and I'm really intrigued to get your uh, y- your opinion on this. Um, 
my opinion is uh, very much that I'm not a fan um, for a whole host of reasons, which we'll get onto, I'm sure, in a second. But what I want to talk to you about, uh, David, about this, if this 4% rule, I believe, will lead people into a retirement of underspending and regret. Now, um, you're nodding, which is cool. So you, you, why, why, why is that? Let's, let's unpick that because I don't want people to fall into that trap. Yeah, so first it's important to, to, to define terms like the 4% rule. The 4% is research by Bill Bengen, 30-ish years old. It just says when you first retire, you can safely withdraw 4% from your uh, from por- portfolio. So um, a million pounds, you could take out 40,000 um, pounds. You would then increase that amount for inflation for 30 years and you're in good shape. Okay, the, the problem with it is it, the most important problem is it, it has the wrong name. Um, it should be called the 25 times rule. Um, Because it only tells you how much you have to have saved at retirement. It really doesn't tell you anything about how much you're going to take from your portfolio on an ongoing basis. So it's a very kind of point in time number. Um, It only applies in theory to like a 65 year old couple. Um, Wouldn't apply to like a single individual who's 75. Um, But to your point, uh, life is all about trade offs, right? Every day, people make hundreds of trade-offs, like how fast you walk, what do you eat, how fast, you know, if you drive somewhere, what route do you take? We make all these decisions. And the 4% rule is really geared towards maximum level of safety. Like I am unwilling to cut back at all. And even the slightest adjustment in spending is like cataclysmic failure. And so to your point, I think that for most people, most retirees, it's going to result in spending too little when they first retire. I think that a better starting place for um, most retirees is 5%. I think 6% could even work based upon your situation. If you've got a lot of guaranteed income and a lot of flexibility. I think the key is, is one, you need a, a number that's personalized to you. Um, you know, we, we all talk about 4%. That assumes this kind of magical age 65 couple. What if you're a married couple that's 45 and retiring super early, or you're an 80 year old single female? Like that, like if for neither one of those people is 4% correct. But I, I, I don't, I don't mind the 4% rule in so much as that it's a, it requires a much higher level of savings. And people, when left to their own devices, would, would honestly think they have to have saved, right? People it kind of blows their mind when you tell them, oh, you can only take out maybe, you know, 5% a year. Like, whoa, whoa, I thought I could take out like 10% a year. I mean, you've got media pundits talk about 8% a year. So I think that 4% probably is, is overly restrictive. But at a minimum, I think it's provided a a reasonable starting place for conversations around how about how much you have to have saved. Like you know, someone could be like, oh, I've got half a million pounds saved for retirement. I'm in great shape. Well, I mean, you know, like that's great, but like what, you know, how much we can get out of there? Like 25 or 30,000 pounds, that's not, I mean, that's not insignificant, but you're not gonna be pulling out 50,000 plus pounds a year off of it. So I think that the key is, is that it provides at least a starting point that isn't nearly as unreasonable as 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 people think left their own devices and other individuals that are in the media often talk about yeah i I actually really like that that if you're and and you know this podcast is aimed at people very near or in retirement but if you're listening to this and you're nowhere near that you might be 15 20 years away actually reverse engineering this and going well let's use the four percent rule to give me an idea about how much I, I would need to give me a pot of money that allows me to actually do more than just a 4% rule, then I think that's a really good kind of framework to, 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 to be able to, um, to be able to kind of work by. It, it, lead, it brings me on to my point about flexible um, or flexibility in retirement income uh, planning, because we just know that life is flexible. And we know that during bad times, people often, you know, self What's the word? Self medicate, maybe like they, they cut costs, right? They do they 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 do this themselves. They know, you know, and we've got a recent example in COVID when it's really really bad. Uh, people do end up just going. Well, I, I know that I don't want to keep spending on some of this stuff, and we'll cut things. Um, and also, more people are very acutely aware of the difference, I believe, between health span and lifespan. So yes, I'm alive longer, but health is more relevant early on in retirement. And then the research now coming out of all of these data points is suggesting that retirement spending falls by about 1% a year because spending money in our 80s is going to be different to our 60s, is going to be different to our, into, in, in our uh, 60s and 70s. So 
with all that in mind, I think having flexibility is so crucial. And I think if you have that flexibility and you understand that, then initial withdrawal rates for a short period of time can absolutely hit five, six, seven, maybe even higher, right? Dependent on your own individuality around what you want to spend your money on, when you want to spend it, and how. And I'd love to just unpick your unpick your brains about um, the flexibility in life and spending, and how that can really impact uh, that, those kind of initial spending periods. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that at least in theory, like all spending over the long term is flexible to some extent. I think that the, the real question in research in these financial planning tools is: if I have to make a change, how is that going to affect me? Right. If I was spending up here and because the markets misbehave or things happen, I've got to drop it a notch. How am I going to feel about that? And I think the key is, is that most retirees are OK going down a little bit. But, you know, as you move further down, like the pain can start to radically increase. Right. So the key is really kind of understanding, like, what are those thresholds? Right. Where are you comfortable taking, you know, maybe a little bit back if you need to versus like that's just too far. And and why that's really important is, is when you kind of stack up all of your assets, I'm defining assets as like your 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 public pension benefits and your the income you can pull from your savings against your liability, your goal. Like so we'll call it like needs and wants or essential and flexible. What it allows you to do is better understand that trade off. Right. Like, you know, OK. I'm going to spend more for my portfolio when I first retire because I know that if I have to, I can cut back. But to your point, I also know I want to go on this vacation. I want to do these things that I probably can't do later. And maybe there's a little bit of risk here, but I'm not going to feel good about myself if, if I don't do it just under this kind of like small probability that at some point I might have to cut back. So I think the key is really understanding kind of what is your level of flexibility inherent in your overall spending, what it would mean for you about, about how you feel about retirement if you do have to make that change. Yeah, absolute key. Well, what are your views on holding cash? You know, what, what, how, how can that help in those scenarios? Because one thing that you absolutely said, uh, which I absolutely concur in, with, is people don't want too much of a pay cut. They understand that a cer- certain circumstances, you know, they, they need to um, not spend as much going forward. But I think cash is hugely underrated. Personally, um, you don't want too much. You know, inflation's a big enemy of 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 uh, of, of a retirement or a, you know a long term uh, of investing. But the ability to have some reserves that are labelled accordingly to allow you to maybe continue to live the life that you want, but it just means your portfolio withdrawals have come down a bit to protect that a little bit more. What, what's your view on on thinking about holding cash for specific circumstances like that? Well, I think that, that there's both kind of economic and behavioral reasons to own cash in a retirement portfolio. Um, the economic ones, I think you alluded to this a little bit, is that cash is a very good inflation hedge, right? Um, when inflation goes up, cash tends to go up. So there's a very good kind of counterbalancing effect that you don't tend to see in things like bonds and equities. Even over the longer term, cash is sort of a much better kind of a, effective way to hedge against inflation. But but second, there's the whole behavioral aspect of it, where – you know, I think that there there isn't much kind of true economic benefits to to segmenting a portfolio into buckets. I think behaviorally, it can really benefit households understand how their portfolio is funding their spending. Where I've met with people before, and they would say, "Oh, I can't take on any risk in my portfolio. It needs to be invested all crazy conservative." And you say, "Well, what, what if we put five years of your spending that's not covered from public pensions, whatever it is, in cash?" And then we kind of invest like the rest of it in these different buckets. Like, oh, that's totally fine. Well, you know, economically speaking, like you could do that with just like a a, a regular portfolio. But when they understand that you've got this kind of cash buffer asset that you can use, you know, so you don't have to draw from the portfolio. I think it definitely can free up people to be more comfortable taking risk in retirement. So I I really believe in that cash is more of a behavioral asset than maybe like an economic one, but there are these kind of dual benefits there towards allocating it, especially in retirement portfolios versus say accumulation portfolios. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd frame this with people as uh, asset assignment. So I think you uh, in, and not that I get this granular, but I do try and say to people, I, I would like to give every pound or dollar a job. And 
the, the the pounds and dollars that are sitting in your pension or your long term investment savings are there to provide ongoing income and do a lot of the heavy lifting and it might go up and down depend on where the markets and valuations are but that's doing a lot of heavy lifting for future purchasing power because we want an inflation proofed type of return that equities do give us over the long term as as history's told us but also i want the shorter term stuff to have to be assigned as well so if you tell me what you want what what are the non negotiables that you would like to spend your money on outside of everyday expenditure over the next 3 years and those non negotiables are if we if you said to me dan i want to book this holiday uh, but you realized your portfolio was down by 15% and behaviorally you'd feel like oh should i really do it right now that's a non-negotiable. That should sit in cash and be assigned and labelled accordingly. It's you know our 60th birthday holiday fund, our daughter's wedding fund, our house improvement fund, our new car fund. Put it all in cash. It's going to be spent over the next three years. And we know that this thing over here can, let, can, can do its ups and downs on a short-term basis, but you've pre-funded that more um, experiential stuff that you absolutely want to do that's non-negotiable. And, and, and as you rightly said, I think that's the benefits of behavioral uh, bucketing type investing. I think like a really important thing that a lot of in investment focused folks might get lost on is that the goal in retirement is not to maximize the return of a portfolio, the alpha of a portfolio, the risk adjusted return, whatever you want to call it, it's to help their client accomplish their goals. And that could actually mean, you know, a quote unquote inefficient portfolio that that has crazy assets that does different things like people are people. People do crazy things. And so if, you're, if, if you have a, a client that would react very negatively to a market downturn and not do things that they would enjoy, it's your job as an advisor to build a portfolio that addresses them. Right. Um you know, this is, you know, like an aside, like I, I'm not really a big fan of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, but let's say that you have a client that is at risk where if it goes up even more, they're gonna just abandon a diversified portfolio. And you know, they're at risk of making a very poor choice because that's the investor there. Like as an advisor, you should be aware of that. And so I think that too often advisors view investing this lens of I have to maximize the portfolio when the, the real goal I think is to help the advisor build a good portfolio, the one that kind of best helps the, the the household, the investor accomplish that goal. And that it's it, I mean, it's obviously very similar it rhymes with these tenets of things like modern portfolio theory but you have to acknowledge this behavioral angle that can be very different across clients or you're not in my opinion doing your ultimate job which is helping kind of maximizing the likelihood of the client actually achieving a good outcome because the point of retirement if we want to label it that or, or or achieving financial independence is is to use your money for something you've worked hard you've saved it you've accumulated it. The point is to now use it. And if you, I believe if you, we, what, you know, the, the financial in investment managers still have the same rhetoric as they had on the way up, i.e. this keep investing, let's keep accumulating, let's keep micromanaging and trading. People will just get lost in that. And then I think they will become more fearful about running out of money than they will about wasting their life. Because they'll just be concentrating on the money and they're not going to go, well, this money is allocated for this and this and this. As you absolutely said, this is not about maximizing returns anymore. This is about spending capital and using it for your dreams and aspirations and goals and needs and wants, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a really important thing is that like, so th uh, spending is kind of like this idea of a seesaw where like we always focus on this risk that you spend way too much early on and that you're, you're, you go broke at some point in time in the future. OK, like that is like, you know, people that talk about, oh, you can only spend two percent of your portfolio. We've got to be crazy safe. Here. Well, like like what that ignores is, is what are all those trade offs you made when you were younger and all the things that you didn't do? Right. Like life is about balance. And I think where advisors can really help retirees is finding that balance to navigate what is the appropriate withdrawal, retirement strategy, whatever, over time that individuals without that kind of help just wouldn't feel comfortable doing. So you can give your clients this license to spend to say, hey, we don't know how long you're gonna live, we don't know what the market's gonna do, but I can help you create a plan that adjusts over time as situations change. There's a ton of value there that I don't think most retirees will be effective at implementing without some kind of professional. Hi everyone, Dan here. 
I just wanted to jump in real quick to say that if you are thinking about or unsure where to start with your retirement plans, then I've put together what I believe to be one of the best free resources for you. My retirement toolkit is packed with videos, guides, webinars, worksheets, blogs, and podcast episodes, and it's completely free to download. Just go to the show notes where you will find the link. Now, let's get back to the show. The reason why people like us exist, and and I would call us advisors or coaches, forget financial, advisors, coaches, and all, because we are not the person that's receiving the advice or coaching, right? I it's the same as as why Tiger Woods still has a golf coach. Rory McIlroy still has a golf coach. I mean, they're pretty decent golfers, obviously, but they still need accountability. They need someone to understand. And you know, by definition, I don't know my own blind, my own blind spots. Neither does neither do the people that we're gonna we're gonna work with. So we need to kind of make sure that 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 that's you know a crucial part of of, of the work that we do. I, I want to touch on uh, risk because we've said it a few times actually um and i uh, I, I do believe that a, a retirement plan or a plan for life second phase or third act or after financial independence right i love all these names i think it's cool if only we could just erase retirement out of people and drop in something else and no one ever knew this thing existed this would be cool um uh, if we create one of those that's got a 100% success rate, i.e. we're telling you that you're never going to run out of money, that to me is 100% failure on, on on kind of living a fulfilled second half of life. Therefore, I think you bring in a very a, a much overlooked risk, and that's regret risk. Um, do, do you think that that's really overlooked, i.e. the regret of ending up at an age where you can't spend it and you never will spend it, and you look back and you go, why did I not do more down? Like, this is ridiculous. Um, and if so, how can we start to think about this in a very different way? So it's funny. I actually just, you know, I mentioned um, the Bitcoin earlier, right? And I actually did. I, like, it fascinates me. Like, I don't get it from like an investor. I'm like, you know, but why do you, you know, how do you know? But to me, like, like, what is the economic argument for someone to own it? Well, it's regret. People feel regret, right? To, it, to all these different, you know, Degrees, and you mentioned a hundred percent success rate. I would say for most folks, like that, that is that's actually a different form of failure, right? Because you didn't take, you know, like you were way, way too conservative, right? Now there are people that would love that; and they're gonna be happy, but like, but there's this whole spectrum. And so I think like the key with all of this is is understanding yourself, understanding like the balance. Like what are you what are you trading off, you know, to go on this path? And I think that that just the way that most financial planning tools are built today. It focuses on, you know, metrics and modeling assumptions that are way too conservative, right? To be clear here, I don't want, you know, old ladies eating cat food. That's not the that's not the, the end game of my thing. It's just that, and I, I get that there's this there's this there's this you want to have safety, but people can make changes over time. I think the lack of of considering this adaptability and the implications that has leads to overly conservative assumptions. Right. You know, when you ask people about like regrets, well, people, you know, when they were younger, they wish they'd saved more. You know, the one thing I, I don't want us to get to is people regret not enjoying their nest eggs. I, I, I'm actually a little worried about that, given how we're how we're now saving for retirement. Like, it's just really, really hard to spend down this pool of assets when you don't know how long you're going to live. You know what the markets are going to do and you don't want to go back to work. And so what, what this kind of led to is this environment of, of people just not not accessing or spending like the portfolio at all, and that's not the right answer. So I think the key is then thinking about how do we behaviorally create mechanisms, solutions, strategies to make someone more comfortable drawing upon their savings to actually fund consumption retirement, which is why they saved in the first place. So, you know, we, we are, we're pivoting to a system that is very inefficient. Um, defined contribution plans are far more inefficient than defined benefit plans because we all have to plan for idiosyncratic longevity risk. You know, we're not going to probably live to age 100, but we've got to plan for that just in case it happens. So I think like, you know, this is to an earlier point you made, this really is going to change the next generation of retirement because we all have to worry about this tail risk that didn't really exist for folks even 20 or 30 years ago. So now all of a sudden, you know, you know, how do I create these strategies and these outcomes when, when I don't know what's going to happen to me as an individual? So it's it's very complicated, um, especially when you kind of overlay all these different kind of economic and behavioral considerations. And the bit 
that I love what you said is the it, it, I, I've sketched about this before. It's almost you get that kind of procrastination is the thief of joy that you, you you just kind of go, well, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? And all of a sudden it's too late, right? Because you're, you're just not understanding the the journey that, that it's going on. And, and there's, there's research uh, over here that, and, and I believe it's the same in, in the States that it's, and because of this, because people are fearful of spending, spending their money, because, um, there is a there's a problem in moving from a savings habit to a spending mindset. Um, and, and, and interestingly, I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but I, I spoke to a client a couple of weeks ago, new client, and I said about this, and they went, "Oh no, 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 I've got I, I can spend money. It's fine. I've got no problem spending money." And I went, "No, you've got no problem spending money. You're earning, right? The, 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 there's a total difference between spending money that." that isn't going to be replaced. That mindset is totally different. And then they were like, oh yeah, oh no, no, that that, that makes sense. Um, but because then people like that are fearful, the research that I've looked at says on average, by age 90, there is still 70% of starting net worth on the table if they retired at age 60. So over a 30 year retirement, they've only spent down 30% of their starting wealth. Because you know investment returns have done well, they've just been fearful about spending money. That that really does frighten and worry me because it's like, well, what the hell was the point in the thirty years previous to that for? Then, if all you're going to do is just take thirty percent off the table, I mean, people are very good at spending income, right? People are not very good at spending savings, right? I mean, you're kind of trained your entire life to spend whatever you make, right? So, you know, when you work for 30 or 40 years, whatever it is, you know, that you can really only spend what you make. You're supposed to save some of it, other stuff, like that's easy. Well, you know, think about like how the how the level of complexity changes radically as we move through retirement, right? So you know, you're 55, literally all of your consumption at 55 is coming from what you make at your job, right? That's really gonna be about it, okay? But as you move into retirement, you're gonna have pension benefits, you could have part-time wage income, you could have, you know, like dividends and coupons from savings. You know, you could have, you know, you know, another pool of assets you can draw upon. Well, like, what do I do, right? I'm, I'm just used to knowing what my what my paycheck is that I can spend. I have to make these decisions. And so, what people do is they don't correctly weigh, you know, to your point, they're gonna say, well, you know, I I don't want to have to worry about going back to work, so I'm just not gonna pull money from my portfolio this year, but I'll do it next year, right? And the next year comes, I'll do it next year. And the problem is, people don't realize is that. Like the things that you would want to spend that money on, like it, it kind of goes away as you get older because like health things happen, life happens. And so you keep kind of delaying gratification, delaying consumption. And what ends up happening is, as you noted with, with that study, there's others as well, is you never really end up spending the money. Now, in theory, you can give that to your kids, you can other things, but people don't typically save for retirement to give money to their kids. They, they save for retirement to enjoy their retirement. So I think there is this, this gap emerging where because of the structure of our system of individual savings, it's really hard to figure out what is that appropriate savings level each year. And there, there, like, there, there are ways around that if you were to convert your your savings to guaranteed income for life, like via an annuity, or there's other structures you can use too. Like that's one way to do it. People are pretty adverse to doing that. And so I think that, you know, like the more we focus on these individual pots that individuals have to spend and pull money from, like the more we're going to see inefficient spending amounts just because of the difficulty of doing so in return. I want to come back to annuities in a minute because I know you've done some wonderful research about um, the impact of guaranteed lifetime income on on, on retirement plans. Um, but but yeah, look, I, I do think that it's it's really important to start to understand what that money is for. And, and it's not only that you haven't spent it at age 90, it's not, and actually, I'm not worried about the money that's left. I'm worried about the memories and experiences that have been left behind, right? That, I mean, the money's irrelevant. It's kind of what it's not what you it's what you haven't done with it. Um, and also during that period, it might be that you then go, well, my children can have it and grandchildren can have it. But I bet there was moments over that 30 years that they would have loved more, you know, during times of struggle, not when they're 50 or 60 and they're thinking about what's going to happen to to their their retirement. And I try and phrase this with people Look, surely you'd like to give during your lifetime, which means you're giving away with a warm heart, not a cold hand. See the gift, 
because actually that 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 makes us happy, right? Giving our money and our time away makes us happy, and there's huge amounts of happiness studies that have proven that. And and when I do hear people say um, that they want to leave a legacy. I think nine times out of 10, I see through it. And nine times out of 10, what they're truly saying is I'm scared of running out of money. So if we can kind of show that you're not going to run out of money or spend it wisely over a shorter space of time, would you want to give your children and grandchildren money before you die? And and I think every time I've asked that question, it's like, oh yeah, of course I would. I'd love to do that. So, you know, I think framing it as to memories and experiences is is important. You're not, le- the money's kind of not the point, right? Right. I mean, to your point, like, like, so when you do research, you have to kind of like quantify happiness. It's just the thing called utility, right? You know, people, people will derive some utility from knowing they can leave money when they die. But again, like that was, that was not usually the purpose behind. Cause like, here's the thing, like, like today or whenever I get paid, uh, maybe it's today, maybe next Friday, whatever. Like I have actively decided not to spend all of my money. I'm going to save for retirement. So I am right now, I'm not going to go on a vacation. I'm not going to do something that I would enjoy today to save for tomorrow. Well, you know, if, if, if then I get to retirement and I, and I don't do this thing, I want to, you know, I'm planning for like, what was the point? Like, I, I'm not saving today to not spend tomorrow to give to my kids. I mean, like I make, you know, we're making an active choice usually to, to give ourselves the opportunity to like enjoy retirement. And I'm just worried that, that we're not doing the best job we could given the change of the structure. Is there a phrase that we can come up with that kind of makes this, a bit more uh, concise, like double delayed gratification. Like you, you're delaying it twice, which doesn't. I won't spend it today to save for tomorrow, but when it comes to tomorrow, I'm going to delay. I'm going to delay it again just in case something happens. I need to give money to the kids. I mean, that's just. I mean, spell that out. It sounds. It sounds ridiculous that that, that would even be considered. But it's not ridiculous. It's perfectly rational because the human beings are kind of as humans. That's kind of what how we think, right? Right. Well, I think that I think that you know, like it's good to you know, it's good for me to have saved because I'm creating this possibility of financial independence in the future, right? But I, honestly, like I'm not saving money for my for my kids. I'm saving money for me to do the things I want to do. And so I think that like that becomes the disconnect. Like it's it's a it's a it's a wise decision to save the day, right? So that I have this pool that I can live off of. But it really it, it, it defeats the purpose of what I'm doing right now if I don't end up actually using those monies because I'm too afraid to do so. And, 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 and it's usually that fear of going, of being broke that causes those problems. Well, like, like you can, you can eliminate that almost entirely via things like buying some kind of lifetime income product. There's an increasing array of strategies, but like that's a really effective way to eliminate this fear about living resources, just buy into some kind of longevity pooled product and that, and there's lots of research that shows that that really helps individuals spend more in retirement because they have less concerns about outliving, you know, their resources. Yeah, I, I want to I want to go there for five minutes. I think it's really important. But one final comment on that: we talked about a, a new retirement, a modern retirement. I think it's even newer that there's an expectation from the children that their parents' retirements are somehow going to help them and fund them and. There's, a, there's this expectation. I don't know what it is, but it feels like it's almost like a there's guilt money sitting there somewhere where where the people that are retired are thinking, "Oh, I better help my children." That that's never happened before. This is this is brand new. My my parents retired. My grandparents retired with no thought process of helping us, and they couldn't because they they didn't have a pot of money. They had an income, right? So, like this, it just feels like it's it's so brand new, and and no one knows how to. Like children don't know how to react. The people, the, the the retirees don't know how to react on this. I think it's 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 a something to really work through and understand going forward. Um, I want to talk on like mon, mor, mortality and longevity risk, and um, I do believe there is a, and I don't know whether this is the right words, but there is kind of a longevity literacy problem. There's that the, the, like, people don't understand it uh, properly. Um, so two points, and you've mentioned annuities and lifetime income a couple of times, which I think connects into this. Do you think there is a longevity uh, literacy problem? Um, and if so, how can that impact the confidence in people's uh, retirements? And then how can lifetime income help take away some of that longevity risk? And then, as you said, I think what's really interesting, the research coming out, that means people are spend more upfront because they've got some, uh, they've kind of got rid of some of that risk at the back end by insuring it away effectively. 
So I do think there's there's really interesting differences in perceptions around longevity at different ages. Um, I I actually just looked at this a few months ago. I forget the statistics, and I you know there's a question in uh, this study called the Health and Retirement Study, um, and it asks people what are their you know how, what are the, what are the odds they think they're going to live to certain ages in the future, and individuals who are 65 years old. You know, do not, you know, like, let's say you're going to live 25 years on average. Let's pick it up here. Okay. Like, you know, they say they're going to live 20 years. They do not assess correctly the likelihood of living longer retirement. But as you move through retirement, that totally flips, right? So you ask someone who's like 80, you know, like, what are the odds of you living to like age 95? They're going to say, oh, it's like 50%. And it's not, it's like, it's like, you know, 25%, whatever else it is. And so the problem with, with longevity is I think that, that, that plays in the, the, this perception of the demand for these products. Because if I don't think I'm going to live more than, I think I'm going to die at like 82, 83, I don't want to buy an annuity, right? And so I think that there's lots of reasons why people don't do it. But you mentioned longevity literacy. I think that could be part of it. Right. I mean, there's all there's other behavioral things like I don't like irrevocably giving away the money that I've spent 40 years working for. But like if I don't think I'm going to be alive, you know, like for more than 20 years because I don't understand longevity, that is definitely going to be part of it. And also people don't understand the relationship relationship between statistics like percentages and couples, do they? So they're going, right. you know, so yeah. th- this, this is about going with uh, most people I work with are couples. And they are absolutely concerned for one another. Um, and if we kind of go through a typical scenario where you've got uh, a husband and a wife, typically the wife will outlast and live longer than the husband. And so the chances that a, a, a healthy couple age 65, that one of them gets to 95 is significantly more percentage terms than than, than um do you know what I mean? Than than both of them, it, it, it's kind of a it, people need to understand that, right? Yeah. It's a fifty percent ish chance today, in in most developed countries, you know, couple age sixty five, relatively healthy, who actually has money saved, who can make active choices, it's going to live thirty years, right? And so I think it's important when you're thinking about longevity, it's not just will I live that long. It's kind of either spouse, and it's it could be the male. It's possible. It's not usually, but there's this unique kind of tail risk when it comes to couples, where it's not just one person that can live a long time. It's either member of that couple that, that, that you have to plan for, which, to your point, is typically going to be the female. Yeah, and then uh, as you said, the odds significantly increase that one of you will get there. So, again, I, and again, I, I, when you talk to uh, couples entering into retirement they are becoming more aware of that longevity risk that one of them will get there and we don't want to be dependent on the state and our children we want some dignity and independence at that point we know we're not going to be spending more so guaranteed lifetime income i just think makes so much sense to explore given that you can insure a bit of that away and then feel free to kind of use the money up front to spend on some of those things. And I know there's huge amounts of research that, as you just said, that's saying that people feel freer to spend money on experiences up front when they know they've taken care of a big bulk of some of the uh, potential costs later in life. I think that the key is, I think every retiree almost would benefit from having their essential expenditures covered with income that is protected or guaranteed for life. Right. People will say, well, David, well, yeah, I've got a client that's got, you know, like millions and millions say they're never going to go broke. And I would say, well, that's probably true. But but don't you think I might change their relationship with their money if they know no matter what happens in their portfolio, they have their essential expenses covered? So, I, you know, I, I'm sure there's reasons why some folks would want to do it. But I, I do really believe that having that base level of, of income can change the way that individuals perceive pulling money from their portfolio. When you know you have your essential expenses covered. And the portfolio just exists to fund more flexible things. I think that's a better environment than someone that only has like half of their essential expenses covered because they're going to keep thinking about the worst case scenario. What happens if the market crashes and I and I can't pay my mortgage and I lose my you know eliminate that as a concern and it changes how we how you how someone perceives accessing their savings to fund spending. And what they use it for, as you said, it doesn't have to be spent on themselves. They can give it to their family. They can support causes that are very close to them you know their their church their uh, charities that they want to support etc there's plenty of opportunities to use money for good if you know that the back end's taken care of um and, and i suppose my, my, my final point and linking all this together is that um 
that the, the retirement smile, uh, as 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 we've uh, as you've as you've coined it, right? Um, and it kind of talks to a lot about everything that we've said. That you know, spending in retirement, real time spending falls during the life of retirement. It's higher early on. And it might tick up a bit during later life. Explain the retirement smile to me. And I do think that that will kind of bring in um, everything that we've talked about a bit uh, as kind of uh, summarizing it really nicely. So I don't know if the smile actually would exist in the UK. I think that smile is just this notion that individuals, as they move through retirement, they, they don't spend at the same rate of inflation. So inflation goes up, say, 3% a year. They spend 1% or 2% more on average. And so like that total amount they spend in today's dollars is, is declining down. Um, at very late life in retirement in the U.S., if you're still alive, the odds aren't great. If you're still alive, you tend to see the average tick up a little bit because individuals have, you know, it's, it's somewhat idiosyncratic where you have these really large health expenses. The median actually keeps going down. Um, and why it might not persist in the U.K. is just because, you know, the way that your health system exists. And so the reason we see that kind of upper kick if you're alive and you're 95 plus ages is – the way that individuals in the U.S. have to pay for long-term care expenses where we don't qualify for Medicaid, it's an out-of-pocket expense. So I actually don't know if you would actually see that, that, that second stage in the U.K., but I think that the most important part of it is, is that individuals in retirement, on average, do not increase their spending every year by inflation. And so when you do a financial plan – you know, especially if you're in the U.S., given healthcare costs and other things, like you know, run it maybe where you assume that spending increases by inflation, but run a second one where you assume that the spending goal drops by, you know, like if inflation's three percent, it only goes up by like one percent a year, whatever else is. And what, what what you see happen is it radically moves money earlier into retirement than you can spend when you're more likely to use it. So, so to me, the key is is just this blanket assumption that people spend more every year, you know equal to inflation. It just doesn't track reality. You talk to advisors that work with clients, doesn't track reality. Sure, there's always exceptions to the rule, but on average, this this idea that individuals increase their spending on inflation just it just doesn't hold a reality. I, I think it's look, I, I I invest clients' money and invest my own money with evidence and science, right? I want to build retirement plans for my clients with evidence and science and the evidence is that i think it, it, it's so important to understand that that most retirement plans i see are just blanketly going up with inflation every year by three percent and that's as you said it simply is not the truth um so i think it's absolutely fundamentally important that there are scenarios built that shows a much more uh, real picture about how this will flow. There is a slight tick up in the UK. I mean, the healthcare system is very different, and it is funded uh, to 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 a to a, a large extent in later life. But people are now, I think, becoming really aware, and it's it, we, we go back to the learnt behaviours thing. Um, they don't want their children to be burdened with uh, with healthcare uh, provision, um, so. You know, it doesn't. If they need to go into care facilities, then the National Health Service is good, but they're not the best care facilities, right? They're pretty standard, um, and typically people glide themselves into that, right? They won't go one day that they go into them. They'll kind of get some people to come in and live in care, and um, but they go back to how they've helped their parents, right? Maybe they've helped their parents, and they're going. Actually, I don't want my children to do what I'm doing for my parents because I feel like I'm. Um, I'm not really enjoying my life now because I'm caring for my, my parents. Um, so they want some provision. They want some back-end provision to go, well, actually, can I put some money away? Can I allocate some money or leave some money there to go? I can pay for some um, private health care. Uh, I can pay for some, if I go into a care home, it's going to be of a good standard and I can pay for it. And I don't need my kids to pick up the emotional and or financial tab at any point going forward. So um I think that that's kind of where it there is some similarity around that. David, this has been such a great conversation. So many wonderful nuggets of of, of information um, in there. J just to kind of finish off, is there, you know, is there a th one thing? I, I mean, that's tough. You've written huge amounts and you've done this for so long. One or two things that you can impart onto the listeners that are thinking about retirement that can really help them start to um, plan this out and think about the reality of what retirement looks like? 
I mean, to me, the biggest thing is retirement is incredibly complicated. Um, if you haven't gotten help, professional help, like an advisor, do so. And it, it might not hurt to get a second opinion, right? I mean, you're going to make a lot of choices. You, you want to make sure you're getting it right. Um, advisors do different things, different ways for different reasons. I think just, you know, making sure you've got a good plan is really, really important. And getting, you know, even a second set of eyes to kind of verify it is worth considering too. So um, I think that you can you can get by okay accumulating money if you're saving 15, 20% a year, you know, invested in a target date fund, you're gonna probably be kind of okay. But I really don't like the idea of people just kind of retiring and not having had, you know, you know, some kind of clear plan about what they're gonna be doing um, in retirement. So that would be my kind of one nugget of advice is just, uh, uh, get help when it comes to return. David, so good. Thank you so much for your time. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I will, onto the show notes, I'll add links. You've got a great website that's got scrolls and scrolls of pages of all your articles, but there's a couple I'm going to pull out, which I think are really important about some of these conversations that we've had today. So um, I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. So thank you so much for, for uh, joining us and, and up the Wildcats, right? That's right, go Wildcats. <laughs> uh, and that just leaves me to thank everyone listening to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Until next time, take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. I hope this show will arm you with insights, strategies, and a newfound excitement for navigating life beyond the nine to five grind. Remember, retirement isn't just an endpoint. It's a vibrant chapter brimming with opportunities for growth, adventure, and purpose. Keep exploring, stay curious, and embrace the next phase of your life with enthusiasm. Until next time, may your retirement dreams continue to flourish and inspire.